Hey everybody and welcome to today's mini episode of Attendance Bias. I am your host, Brian Weinstein. While he was writing his epic Lord of the Rings trilogy, writer J.R.R. Tolkien said, The tale grew in the telling. That phrase crossed my mind more than once when I spoke to today's guest, Matt Campbell, about the legendary ghost played on May 22, 2000 from Radio City Music Hall in New York City. Many episodes of this show are usually structured to last about 25 or 30 minutes, but as I spoke with Matt about Fish in 2000, about this version of Ghost, and especially his love for the 2.0 era, it became clear that if I were to edit this conversation to fit into a 30-minute runtime, it would be a disservice to the conversation itself, to Matt, and to you, all of our listeners. Like some other guests on Attendance Bias, I got in touch with Matt through the Fish community on Twitter. I noticed that in responses, conversations, crosstalk, and tweets, Matt would always stand up for 2.0 Fish. It didn't matter which song, it didn't matter which jam, or what conversation was going on. He seemed to be the go-to guy for all things 2.0. Just for fun, he even compiled a collection of thoughts, media, and publications of all things from the February 2003 tour and the summer 2003 tour. He obviously had a lot of thoughts about 2.0 and a lot to say about it. So even with his love for 2.0, I was really surprised, but I wasn't shocked when Matt picked the Radio City Ghost for this episode. Truly a legendary jam at a busy time in the band's career. There's a lot to say about it. So we'll go over Matt's projects about the summer 2003 and February 2003 tour and his Cornerstones project to focus on the covers of both The Grateful Dead and Fish. So enjoy my conversation, this quote-unquote 53-minute mini-episode with Matt Campbell about the Radio City Ghost from May 22, 2000 at Radio City Music Hall in New York City. Matt Campbell, a.k.a. Famertime 2.0 from Twitter, Welcome to Attendance Bias. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm just so excited. I'm excited too. For these many episodes, I ask a guest to pick a song or a jam that's meaningful or important to them. And you picked what I would consider so far the most high profile one of all. Mm -hmm. You chose Ghost from May 22, 2000 at Radio City Music Hall, aka the Radio City Ghost. Almost everyone who's probably listening to this podcast has either heard it or heard of it. And I can't wait to get into it, not just to break down the jam itself, which is roughly 20 or 25 minutes, but also to go over the context in which it was played, to talk about Fish in the year 2000, to talk about when Fish played Radio City Music Hall. And then we'll get into that and we'll start off, we'll get to know you. So we've got a lot to talk about today. So to start off, let's get to know you a little bit. I understand you're from Kansas City, Missouri, right? Yeah, suburbs of Kansas City, um, technically, Independence, Missouri, home of Harry S. Truman. You and I got into conversation over Twitter where nearly every comment that you post, I would say, I don't know, 80%, 85% or that you're baited into has to do with the 2.0 era of fish. So let's talk about that era just for a little bit and what it means to you. Uh, When I was taking notes or writing down notes to prepare for this, my notes say that you are the quote go to guy on fish Twitter when it wow. comes to 2.0 recommendations, criticism, and and I think you agreed with this and fluffing for oh, people who criticize perfect... 2.0. Yes, the perfect word is is fluffing, Brian, in every way. Again, I I, I think I am probably its number one cheerleader 2.0. I don't know if I'm the most, you know, informed. I, I I try to be, and I I listen to it a ton, um, but I think there is folks that just are more pre, you know, inclined to be the stat person, you know, and keep those things in their head. I'm pretty good at that stuff, but what I am really good at is just blindly fluffing something (laughs) that I really love. And 2.0 is just in my heart. I I noticed early on when I got on the, you know, fish internet, it was a, a place course you know 2.0 had just kind of started in some ways kind of i guess maybe it was a a phenomenon i noticed later on um in social media i guess once you know twitter and facebook came around that 2.0 was really looked down upon and and really kind of um so i'm just always been a um you know underdog guy too you know that was my years my my most um heavy touring years as well i've seen them so boy i just yeah i got real loyal to 2.0 fast 
<laughs> I've always seen 2.0 as kind of the generation X or the middle child of Perfect. the fish uh, concept or the fish era breakdown. Whereas 1.0 and 3.0 fans are so super passionate and like bickering back and forth. But the 2.0 era or people who really are into it just kind of keep to themselves with a quiet confidence. Kind of, I love we, we know it. We're happy with it. We didn't ask for more. We didn't ask for less. Here's what it is. We love it and don't apologize for it. Oh my gosh. I love that. I love that, Brian. That is a 100% perfect way of summon us 2.0ers out there. And there's a lot of us out there. We just, it's hard to um, explain. I think sometimes in a, you know, in a social media post or something, why we love it, what it is we love about it. But um, yeah, we're, we're out there. We're out there. Silent majority. (laughs) <laughs> no. I, I really think now, again, I want to be careful because I do think in, in 2004, there are some gems there. And I, I think they really stepped out fully on that limb and boy, it was shaky. And so many times it was bending to uh, the point of breaking in every way. Um, and it, it, it eventually did break, you know, I, I think, but that also, really brought out some incredible creativity, some imagination in their playing, some difference in their playing. As much as, again, I love 1.0, love 3.0, love what I hope to hear in the future, you know, I think. But I think they took the most chances in that late stages of 2.0, good or bad, you know, and I totally get why folks are like, "That's, that's the bad, you know, and I think also what I'll always tell folks is that because 3.0 happened, that al- I, that always allowed me to look back at 2.0 more fondly, if that makes sense. Yeah, it right? makes perfect sense because after Coventry, you know, I was exhausted. Oh. I was miserable. My friend and I drove home all night. So you know, we stopped in the morning <laughs> for pancakes. I have very, uh, ironically, I think I have very sharp memories of oh. the end of that era. But almost the end of me as a on a personal level, like just a terrible time of life. Yes. But (laughs) but to your point, I remember thinking within like two days afterward, number one, I wasn't that unhappy that it ended because I I'm very cynical by nature. And I remember having the thought, if that's how they're going to play, maybe it's better that they're not going to play anymore. I had that thought um, after the first night of Great Woods and after Camden, which I know that you and I have di- different opinions about a little, but, but that's okay. I get yeah. it though. But yeah, so I had that thought, but I also had the thought it's good that they're over because now it puts everything in context. Now we could kind of measure the band's progress and look at them where they developed, where were the highlights, where were the low lights without the unexpected future coming. That really is interesting. And I, I think that's a great perspective on it. I think for me, I, I, I took it a little different direction. I, I started to kind of, I didn't listen to fish for a long time. You know, I really kind of, you know, I think bitterly in some ways, like you had mentioned, you know, I got to a point where I was a little bit mad at him because they kept coming. Like they kept quitting at the times that were perfect for me to see fish. Yeah. <laughs> and weirdly, Trey, he never called me and asked me about this. I <laughs> thought he would. I'm still a little upset. Trey, you know, my number, but no, but like, I, that's what really upset me, you know, is these are my prime year. These are the ones, you know, and then, you know, they literally waited till I had kids to then come back, you know? So for a long time, there was some bitterness there. Um, and it took me a while to put it in proper context, you know, but when I did, I, I just, I said, Hey, explore some of this 2.0 stuff. And in some ways, maybe I had such a bad reaction in that first moment that I wanted to try again, you know, and I wanted, and when I did, I was like, Oh, there's just some really great stuff here, you know, and some great memories. And as, as sad as some of them are, because Coventry was just a, a sad affair. I mean, I call it, it's, um, to me, it was a funeral in some ways, you know, a celebration of life. I don't know. Barely. You know, it was a muddy, <laughs> rainy funeral, which is even exactly worse. people are walking in, barely didn't get in some fo- I mean, just as bad as honestly it could end and be. And so it took me a minute, um, but I love that perspective. Let's talk about uh, two projects that, or maybe two and a half projects that you've been working on centered uh, on Twitter, I think, unless yes. you can tell us about some more outlets for it. So let's talk about the winter 03 and the summer 03 project, and then we'll touch on cornerstones. So we could kind of categorize this. So the winter 03 project, tell us a little bit about that. Again, I I think it's one of those tours that folks 
do actually give a, a lot of love to, um, and I think absolutely appropriately so. I personally saw a show, um, 2003. That is one of my, if I'm known for two things, probably on Fish Twitter, it would be 2.0 loving and then very specifically 22003 loving um, the Chicago show at Rosemont. And so I just, I love that tour. I love the Midwestern aspect of that tour. You don't get a ton of that as you get later into, you know, th- late 2.0 and in 2004 i mean just didn't happen 3.0 you get very little you know midwest we start to come back a little bit but um we still don't get enough in my opinion so that whole tour just love every second of it and wanted to chronicle it and celebrate it and And how do you do that when you say about chronicle and celebrate it what does the project look like to the average person checking in my new thing is my new addiction in some ways um is YouTube fish videos and compiling them, putting them together, cutting them into clips, doing different silly stuff with them. Um, So I just do a little highlights reel of each show. Okay. So some of the best jams, if I can find them on YouTube, I take about a 30, 45 second clip of four or five of those jams, put them together because you only get two two minutes and 20 seconds on on Twitter. So I kind of cut it into real quick sections. And then me, um, a friend of mine, Scott Makita, and he's at Scott Mick. Dreaming dreams. I know I can't remember the numbers after Twitter's so hard with the numbers, right? At the end of, of people's um, Twitter handles. And then the great went, um, Kevin, we um, write up the just little quick reviews of each show. And then I put it into a little note section and afterwards. So it's just real quick. It's a real quick um, click in and it's perfect to me for Twitter because it's, you know, you, you'll watch and check out the whole thing in three minutes. And, and you, you, and you one, get a good idea of what that show's about. Right. They're like recaps. And then and then you have one coming up this summer, I'm assuming, uh, for the, the Summer 03 tour. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we're doing um, Summer 03 as well. Um, again, love that tour. Love that um, section of time for Fish. I think there's some phenomenal shows in there. Um, so, yeah, I can't wait to do that as well coming up. So that's one project. Let's talk about the other that you have going on, which seems a little bit more expansive and not as specific as the winter and summer 03 projects. You have another piece called Cornerstones. Tell us a little bit about Cornerstones. Yeah. So Cornerstones is a deep dive into the covers of Grateful Dead and Fish, of the Grateful Dead and Fish. I have always been interested in where our music comes from and the roots of the things that we listen to and love, um, what, what are their influences, you know, and where, where did they, you know, get into this music? And then where even going farther back than that, you know, where was their influences influenced, you know? So I just always love that. And so I noticed there was a gap in some ways, I think for some folks of knowledge of where some of the covers that we love come from, you know? And so I really wanted to stress that, Um, there's so much history to this music and songs like dancing in the streets, songs like sneak and Sally songs like, um, you know, Samson and Delilah have such incredible history, history in the African American community that, um, I think has to be celebrated, should be celebrated more and any chance that I could get to, to promote that and to, um, educate folks on that was, was kind of the idea behind it. And where can people find or access the Cornerstones project? That that one is on YouTube. Um, so it's under yeah, Famer Time on YouTube. And for me, it's really more of a passion project than a, hey, you know, let's, you know, I, I would love for people to watch it. And I appreciate those that do. I know uh, some folks do. And I, I but um, so it's it's probably harder to find than it should be. <laughs> so I will make it easy. We'll All make right, it thanks, easy. Buddy. So it's, it sounds like a, a musical family tree sort of. Uh, exactly. Based on covers that you would assume most fans of Fish or and or the Grateful Dead would already be familiar with. 100%. Yes. You nailed it. Attendance bias lightning round. All right. So before we get to the Radio City Ghost, let's get to know you not just as a as a Twitter handle, as a 2.0 fluffer or as a Cornerstones uh, family tree genealogist. Let's talk about just as a fish fan and let's go for the attendance bias lightning round. So yes. tell, tell us about your first fish show. 11, 1996 municipal auditorium, Kansas city, Missouri. Why amazing. Why am bathtub gin, vibration of life. What was your last fish show? 
I believe it's 612 19. It is the Gloria show. Um, St. Louis, um, the night 19, summer, summer 19. What's your favorite song? A jam song, Ghost. Mm. Interestingly enough. Yeah, um, well, no shock there. <laughs> weird. And then um, for just composed song, Pebbles and Marbles. What's your favorite venue to see fish? Um, outdoor, I think I said the gorge um, is tough to beat. Although, again, Red Rocks, just again, neck and neck there. Um, and then um, indoors, like I said, I did say Radio City. To really tie this in here, um, yeah, that's that's a really specific answer for literally two shows. I know, career. I know. You, you like that? I read. There's such great venue. I haven't really done enough of indoor venues. I've done a lot of outdoor venues. I say overall, the Gorge is just to me a perfect venue for fish. You know? If you had to pick one tour to attend, summer tour, fall tour, or New Year's Eve run. Yeah, New Year's Eve, because I've never, re- other than Cyprus, I've never done a New Year's Eve run. So that is that is my goal someday, to be a, doing an MSG, YM, <laughs> all that. New Year's, a real New Year's run like that, someday. All else being equal, indoor fish or outdoor fish? I go outdoor here. I I mean... <sighs> I just because I go for the whole thing and I think outdoor is the whole experience. I think indoor, if it's the wrong venue, it can not seem right. Any songs you're chasing? This is a sob story, buddy. But it (laughs) Harpua. I have never seen Harpua and I always see folks, you know, oh, well, I just got northerly Harpua or I'm like, y'all stop. If you, if you've gotten one, just, be you know you're blessed own it oh love it it's okay because the one i saw are, was the baker's uh, dozen that's it yeah and i know people don't love that one you know like and i'm like but i promise you when you don't have a harpua you will take any harpua i promise you you'll take all of those and i, I also don't think either one of those are bad they're fun people are people hate fun sometimes i, I don't <laughs> I don't get that brian why do they do that it's a it's a hard place to live man we live in a tough world. It maybe uh, that's it. Are there any songs that are chasing you that you see all the time? I have seen, and I have, I have around forty shows. I I can't remember. I always tally it up wrong, so I don't have a ton of shows. And so, I have, and that's again part of why I miss Harpua. I have some big shows. I have this Radio City. I have Cyprus. It, you know, some some pretty great. Those are high profile you know, shows. Big shows, you know, but I don't have a lot of you know, numbers, because again, I'm a Midwest kid. Midwest kid has to go all over, you know, all over God's green earth to get to a fish show, you know, and, and that's tough when you got kids and the whole sugary, you know, now. So um, I have seen a ton of mellow moods. I have four mellow moods, three or four mellow moods. And that's not, that's weird. And, and I, cause I know there's not that many, um, but I've got it as a mellow mood. Um, there's a 925 show or in september see the 924 925 um in minnesota that was a mellow mood and so yeah i've seen and then dix in 18 i went to dix in 18 and there was a mellow mood so three or four mellow moods weirdly i feel like we've already discussed this but what is your favorite overall fish year yeah it's 2003 i will get, I, I mean i have to basically delete my account if i don't answer 2003 <laughs> yeah you gotta you gotta walk the walk What's your favorite post show snack? Oh, I uh, I love Jack in the Box tacos, the gross, greasy. And I know I should answer a lot food, and there is some great lot foods to eat after. But usually, I don't. I'm not a big post lot guy. I kind of neither am I. I want to get in the car and get out of there. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Usually, I love pre lot. Not not a hater of a lot. Believe me, by any means. But especially as I've gotten older, I'm not a, so. I like to hit up those fast food joints on the way home. And it's got to be Jack in the Box, the gross, greasy, $2 taco things. And final question of the lightning round. What is the weirdest thing you've ever seen at a fish show? Oh, my gosh. (laughs) I mean, this question is so awesome because there's just you you think of so many memories and there's just so much. I did stay on theme here, though, and wanted to talk about Project Formal and – you know, here on this Radio City Music Hall shows, again, this was early, you know, fish internet. 
And one of the really cool things that happened was they started to put out this thing that, hey, everyone dress up, dress up for the Radio City shows, you know, since it's a fancy kind of opulent place. Let's all dress up. Don't look it out. Let's, you know, <laughs> like, let's now I weirdly did not. I, I was pretty skeptical. And again, I was pretty I was kind of a noob, you know, anyway. So I'm going I I feel like I'm going to get a top hat and a tuxedo and I'm going to be the only one there. Right. And it's, this is all a joke on the noobs. Right. And so I went pretty normal fish, you know, gear, but so many people dressed up and it really, you know, went for the project formal thing and really made it look cool. Um, And it was really interesting seeing again, our, of all our fan base, right. Dressed up for one and then two in this building that, we none of us have any business being in you know <laughs> ultimately you know this is the kind of place that again 20, 25 30 years ago they would have they kicked us out of you know like they said this is not where hippies get to hang out you know but um but and i say that and ready i know the dead played it and other bands have played it you know but i just felt like it was such a juxtaposition of our crew in that place it was just very weird i guess when was this show played well talking about our crew in that place. Let's talk about the context in which this show, May 22nd, 2000, was played and talk about Fish in 2000 in general. So this Radio City show was part of a two-spot. It was the second night of a two-night run. And then the next night at the Roseland Ballroom, I feel like these three shows are often exempted from discussion when we talk about Fish in 2000, just in general, that people kind of see these as their own little micro tour. Uh, because at Absolutely. the time, Fish released Farmhouse on May 16th, so just about a week before this show is played. And these shows were part of the band's, I don't know if you'd call it a media blitz, but it was part of their promotion for sure. And so in addition to these Radio City shows, the uh, the Roseland Ballroom show was recorded to be broadcast on VH1. I think the show was called Hard Rock Live later yeah. that year. I was a senior in high school at the time. I was going to graduate within a month or a little bit less. I tried to get tickets to all three of these shows. I didn't get tickets to any. And it was still a little far from me, uh, both as a fan and just my confidence to go to a show by myself uh, because my friend Craig got tickets with his sister. So I was kind of on the outs of that. And I wasn't going to go to a show without a ticket. Right. I just I didn't have that gumption yet. You know, I would. I don't know if I would today. There was a good 10 years in between when I would have done that. I don't know. I'm going no matter what. Yeah. Right. So I remember not much um, at the time about show reviews, but I do remember the news coverage and images from it. Like you mentioned, the people were dressed up in kind of goofy tuxedos or actual tuxedos and ball gowns and things like that. But I thought how crazy it was at the time that Fish was playing such small venues at what I think at the time was their height of popularity. I think they were more popular then than they had ever been before in New York City, the media capital of the world. And so this is that was kind of the context in which these were played. They were kind of an island of shows, sort of like the island tour in that. But this was more for a specific purpose of promoting Farmhouse. So where were you in the spring of 2000 that led you to Radio City? Pretty much in the midst of 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 bombing out of college so perfect you know so that's that's perfect time to get really you know into you know flying to go see fish um so that's kind of on a personal level that's where i was at um and um i had done cyprus okay and so now i i was i was full on i mean i I was now a complete i had bought in in every way to to the fish experience okay so i get um, I get my buddy and say, Hey, I'm going to try to get these radio city tickets. Okay. I think it's probably once in a lifetime. I don't think they'll ever play radio city probably again. I mean, I doubt we'll get the tickets. I mean, there's no way, but I'm going to try about it. Okay. I'm gonna and try. you're in Missouri at this point. I'm in Missouri. I am okay. in my, my, my parents' rental house where I lived at the time. <laughs> again, lots of just really, <laughs> really looking it up big time at this point in my life. Um, so it was perfect. And, and so, um, so I'm like, okay, so I get on the phone. But this was when fantasy tour was like a thing. Love it or leave it. Mostly leave it nowadays for sure. But fantasy tour was, I was on it and someone posted, right? Maybe like 45 minutes, an hour before the show, someone posted a number and said, hey, 
This is the box office number to Radio City. And all these folks are going to hit up, you know, the websites and call these numbers and the ticket masters and blah, blah, blah. Call directly to the Radio City box office. So I think tickets went on sale, you know, 10 o'clock, you know, something like that. So nine o'clock my time. Get up. I'm right on it. Call. I get through, Brian. I get through. First call. I mean, again, I'm just, again, I'm 100% had, had resigned to I'm not getting through. So then I have to decide, right? Then like. Now the shock of oh my gosh I'm through to this lady what do you need so I say okay <laughs> I right I go okay you're the dog I that can't. finally caught the car exactly do what, what do it. I do right I don't know I can't fit it in my mouth so so um she says well do you want you know five twenty one five twenty two do you want first night second night I could only do one night I knew that okay and so I said give me five twenty two give me second night okay. And that was a fateful decision. That was that what a blessing. What a, usually I would make that wrong decision. And I don't, I hate to hate on 521 because it's great, but it doesn't have the ghost, you know? I mean, it doesn't have the moment from Radio City, you know? And I, I chose 522, called my buddy up. He's dying. Like, I, he can't believe it's real. He starts making flight plans. We head to New York City. Again, Kansas City kids in every way, noobed out, stand, you know, looking up at these skyscrapers, you know, again, just blown away. Had you Incredible ever been to New experience. York City before at this point? First trip to New York City. We're staying in Times Square at, a, at the Novo Hotel. I don't even know if that's a, but it's a, it's a huge hotel. And it's right there in the middle of Times Square, right outside is Roseland. So we walk outside and there's all all our people are all lined up on the street on the sidewalk waiting in line for Roseland tickets. I mean, as wide eyed and as just blown away as I could possibly be. And again, just so blessed for that experience. It really changed my life. I got, I went to the world trade center. I, on an absolute whim. Again, about this part of, of the context of these shows, like you said, that fish is playing Radio City. They probably won't again. I don't 6, think they 000, will. I think you, you mentioned, you know, Roseland being 3,500. I think even even Radio City is small. I, I looked up capacity it is. is like 6,000. Yeah, for concerts. So it is. Yeah, because so it's small. not it's not really a major concert venue. It, it was built as a as a movie theater, you know, and, and for live radio broadcasts. Right. So it it was it wow. wasn't built for live music per se. Um, and so mm -hmm. it's it's not a typical venue by any stretch when it comes to the world of fish. Oh my gosh! You know, and and the Rosen Ballroom. Like it? I mean, the bar. Sorry, sorry, my God. No, no, no. I was just going to say the Rosen Ballroom was built for jazz. You know, it was it was it was a ballroom for you think with a huge dance floor, and it was built mm -hmm. in. I I'll fact check this, but I believe in the 1920s during the Harlem Renaissance. And and it's obviously gone over cool. renovations. It doesn't look like that anymore. But these are these are venues that maybe Trey Acoustic will play now. You know, right. they're they're not big enough for Fish. Um, I saw him. I think it was now two years ago at a uh, at the Carnegie uh, wow. at Carnegie Hall. Wow. And yeah. so, like when you talked about the opulence mixed with what we used to show up looking like, right? It's just. It's dissonant. It's it un. It was. I, I went down. I had to go to the bathroom, so I went down. I was so, so glad I did. I, we didn't. We had not gone to the basement. There's a basement bar or like a mm -hmm. downstairs bar at Radio City, and I, I, we were just. We had our tickets. We're in the orchestra pit, so that was pretty cool. We were pretty down. You know, we were down on the floor, not on the balcony. That's what you um, get from calling the venue, by the way. Yes, unbelievable. I had no idea, and so um, we'd mostly just kind of checked out. I mean. The kind of lobby as you go in, which blows you away, right? Because you don't you don't really get a sense of that at all on the outside. I mean, it just looks like it's iconic. The the Radio City, you know, the the neon and the the, the pictures, or you know, the, the all the, yeah, the marquee, right? The marquee, yeah. But you but you don't really get like, oh, it's a fancy, amazing place. But when you step in that place. It's incredible. I mean, it just blows you away how incredibly fancy and luxurious it is. And then, and so we were blown. We, we go to our seats. So I'm like, oh, I got to go to the bathroom. It's right before the show. And I went, I went to the to the basement bar, and I, I wish again. You always wish you had pictures. You know, I wish you had cameras at times. I, I, the scene down there was like everything you would think of of our 
group in a place where we had, again, the dissonance, where we had no business. It's so beautiful. And there's these mirrored, everything is just like as pristine as it can be. And it is just nothing but dreadlocks and <laughs> all over the place. So awesome. Yeah. And just for context, again, we should remind anyone who wasn't around at the time in 2000 fish, fish fans as an entity, we were not at our best. Of course not. No, we were in late 1.0 mode, yeah, right? Pills, you know, you know designer drugs were, you know, were of choice. It was, uh, we were, this, it was not a good scene. No, I'll, I'll tell you one of the wildest moments. You speak of this, the wi wildest moments besides this ghost music wise and just experience wise of the concert was um, CK5 turns on the house lights. Yeah, they about, look great. Yeah, during split open and melt. And I mean, again, you, you look around <laughs> and it's just everybody losing it in that very late 1.0 way, right? The security just wide eyed and like, what is happening? You know, but they, they handled it well. I didn't notice that it was any, you know, no one, they, I think that again, you saw what you mostly see with security is just smiles and laughing and like, what am I watching? What am I seeing? You know? And then when they turn those house lights on though, Brian, I mean, nothing like it, just an absolute madhouse. <laughs> and before we get into this ghost to set it up, of all the songs, of all the jams you could have chosen, why this one? I love this jam. Just truly one of them. I think, it's, again, it's got it all. It's, it's It sounds almost composed. I mean, I really feel like it's one that, that like, I, I, again, I'd love to know the story about it because I wonder if this wasn't one of those ones where they were practicing, whatever it was. Remember, this is, like you said, it's a promotional tour. We're playing in front of, we're at Radio City, a lot of record execs, a lot of stuff like that. If there wasn't just a ton of, of, practice in that in that time frame right before those shows and it just to me it clearly shows if there was i would go okay that makes sense because it just sounds almost composed it's composed of it like a jam that i could think of fish having you know all right well let's get into it you ready yes so the beginning of this ghost I thought that it was played at a slower tempo than it usually is, than what I usually expect or what I hear. The song part is pretty standard, even there, even though there are parts where aren't as tight as it was maybe in 97, let's say, or even in 3.0. But the beginning of the jam, which I think is about six minutes in or so, like once we get past the normal ghost part, the song portion, I hear Mike all the way. And I don't know if it's the venue. I don't know if it's the recording that we had available, but he is really where my ear drifted to almost to the point where you can't even hear Trey or Paige. Uh, it was slow and smooth. And I was just, I was all in. And the only unfortunate part I thought was at least due to the recording, it was like a mega chatty New York city crowd. You know, everyone yes. is so lucky to be there, but they won't shut up. shocker right yeah. and welcome to new york yes exactly it's us okay i love new yorkers i'll say it so um, you don't have to there you go thank you um but no I, 
yes. So it's a blessing to have those recordings, you know, and on we listen on the fish in app, things like that. It, it is so chompy and it's a shame because when you find good recordings of it, it's, it changes it. And it really, you hear things that you don't really hear in the crowd recordings, you know, the audience recordings, but um, yeah, no, I, I, I completely, I, I always kind of thought it sounded again, it's what going back to, you know, maybe the practice part and the promotional part. I thought the initial ghost section sounds a lot like the recorded part of the album you know, the actual studio album ghost where, you know, it kind of starts real early with the jam whistle, you know, or the siren, right. You know, it's, that's kind of how it starts. It doesn't click on at some point. It starts siren. Then it's, yeah, really kind of a slow pace, very kind of, yeah, like a step. Definitely when you listen to incredible to listen to that compared to what we just saw on dinner in a movie, right. The ghost um, from the Island tour, because that thing is on uh, going 100 miles an hour yeah right where this one is absolutely funked out from the beginning yeah and once the jam really gets going you mentioned page leads the way especially toward the end but starting at around nine minutes or maybe nine and a half minutes it already becomes very heavy on the synths on the synthesizers and this to me is what i think in my head or when i hear in my ears when i think fish in 2000 this kind of techno groove that really and I mean this in a good way, it doesn't really sound anything like fish. Right. right. I mean, you could easily take these a couple of these sections out and go, this is like some early and I'm, I'm no electronic music fan, you know, or, or I, I like it. And I'm learning about it, but I'm no expert. But to me, it does sound like you would hear it in a club. You know, this is like the kind of music you would hear in a house, you know, club or, a, you know, like. And so, yeah, it's very unique to them. And I, it's again, I wonder if it's almost rehearsed, if they didn't find this groove somewhere in a practice someplace and go, hey, this, this is it. And I always liken it too. I remember in your notes you mentioned, um, you know, aliens and and it feeling very extraterrestrial. And that's I see it as yeah, that's like first contact right there is in that nine minutes, eight to nine minute section where Paige is just laying into the synths, and it's like wow, we just we're meeting the you know UFO for the first time. Yeah, it, it was, was a two thousand deal. Yeah, yeah, and it wasn't too long before Paige would not lean on it, but kind of find a very comfortable place for it in his holster. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then around 12 minutes in a really full on groove begins because this has not been a very groovy jam yet. And I don't mean that as a, as a pejorative, but it just, it's not their style at the time. Mm -hmm. And Trey starts adding a, a melody with his guitar. And I, this really caught my ear because about 13 minutes in, he hadn't played a lot of melody. He didn't have a melodic sense. He was very much on his rhythm guitar. And yes. it, I don't, I'd have to listen to it again with a timestamp, 
One of my notes says this jam is moving at its own pace. No one is really guiding it or pushing it. It kind of started at this point to feel like an independent organism separate Uh, from the band itself. I love that description, Brian. That is so perfect. I mean, to me, that is, it's all synergized right there. You know, like when I hear fish talk about, or when you hear Trey talk about, we don't really do solos we do band solos right we we don't you know so i just feel like they're connected at those at that moment you know yeah around that 12 14 minute mark it's a little tenser you know too i think when trey you know kind of drops in that little you know jangle guitar and starts to get that melody it starts to tense and up a little bit and starts to feel a little more you know again it's not quite so dancey and a little more like ooh now we're heading into like some more experimental sound space you know I remember in college, I was trying to get my friend Matt into the band and I was, I gave him a copy of New Year, not New Year's, uh, Halloween 96. And he's not a big talking or wasn't, or maybe still isn't a big talking heads fan. It was just the way they were playing. I thought might appeal to him. And he said he likes it, but he can't really dig into it. So what I said to him is try this, try to use your ear and listen to the what's being played and then just use your ear to focus in on one band member for 30 seconds and then kind of, you know, zoom out yeah, and see how that one band member's playing fits into the sound as a whole, like a tapestry and then try to dance around to each different band member. And that advice was, it came back to me while I was listening to this jam again, because it's so satisfying. Oh, right. You can plug into e- any of them. And it, they're just hitting the perfect notes at the perfect time. Like you said, I mean, you can you can zoom completely out. You can get that drone view, and it sounds like one instrument. It almost, again, sounds like someone pushed play on a, on a tape, you know. And Or you can zoom way in closer and hear every little intricate note that each one of them is playing and just the inc- incredible fills and stuff that's going on in this from all of them, you know, just and whenever you feel like, oh no, it's getting a little stagnant. Somebody does something that just makes it wonderful again. Right. Right. I mean, he kind of bounces back. The piano comes back a little bit too. 
Um, you know, he gets a little less synth heavy, and yeah, he right, he he does come back to more semblance, and in some ways, it gets back to you. You catch Ghost a little bit, like you catch yeah. a more traditional Ghost riff, and I almost feel like they almost ended it there. Like there's about there's a moment in 17, 18 minutes where you start to hear Ghost, the more traditional back to Ghost jam happening, and I'm going. Ooh, it's. I feel like they were almost done. You know, I said, ah, let's. Ooh, we got a little more of this to go, and I'm so glad they did because I love these last sections. Yeah, let's talk about the last five minutes of this jam. Starting really, I wrote down at about 24 minutes, the 24 minute point. I think the whole thing on the recording is about 28 total. So we're really in the you know rounding third base. Yeah, I wrote that it's like everything in the jam and what the band is capable of comes together and brings us to another level of being. I was really, and I was just sitting on my couch in 2021. I was just sitting on my couch with headphones on. I wasn't at Radio City. I am into fish. Of course I am, but I wasn't as irrationally obsessed with them as I was in 2000, you know, ready to just throw everything out the right. window and follow. It's an objective, objective listen. Right. And those are the words that came out of my mind that it's if we were in outer space before, then now we're at the end of 2001, you know, with the giant baby uh, in the the kind of um, <laughs> embryo sort of that last scene of that movie that we're kind of reborn into a new understanding of what this band is capable of. Like we're at the end of a journey for these last uh, five minutes and, and it, we've already loved 25 minutes of it. Ah, oh, Brian, that's just an incredible um, description, and I couldn't agree with you more. I always feel like this is very extraterrestrial. Just a, a, I, I always look at it as very kind of in sweet, and I feel like this last suite of the, of of the the jam is just in every way that moment of oh, we we met the aliens, they gave us this <laughs> incredible knowledge, right, and now they've left, and we're just basking in this you know glow of of understanding and you know, the universe at peace and just this like I, I if every jam ended like this i would never be mad you know i mean i just feel like it it's and i can whistle i could that tune you know the do 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 that that i i, I can't i'll never forget it you know it's in my so when i hear that I, I could, you know, again, it's instant, you know, Pavlovian, you know, response. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
because it's just so perfect of the end of a jam to me. And again, lets you bask, like you said, in this like feeling of, wow, we have been on a journey and we're at the end. And instead of just like so many jams, so many, we think of rip chords, right? Yeah. You know I mean? This is the opposite of a rip chord. This is exactly how you just ease back, you know, to, to reality. And I'm curious at the end of it, if you remember, because now this was many years ago, did you or your friend who you walked out, not walked out because there was still the end of the set and then the encore to be played, but were you aware at the time that this was, in capital letters, something big? 100%. And this was pretty, uh, this is pretty early in my fish experience. You know, this is six, seven shows in, you know, this is, no, I had I'd done Cyprus, so I felt really you know, again, like a vet now, you know, but um, I still just really had so much to learn and so much to know. Um, and I, I remember it vividly walking out and not only my friend, but just everyone around us going, oh, that ghost, that ghost. Did you hear you, Man, that ghost, you know, I want to hear that <laughs> ghost again, you know, like, so it, I, and most of the time, it's not the case. I've, 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 I've spent a lot, you know, I've been to shows that have had great jams and I don't, I, I think I'm personally always somebody who needs some time too with it a lot of times. Like in the moment, I think every, I, I, I am guilty of being, you'll, you'll be shocked, but, I, but I'm a fluffer of every, every moment when I'm there, right? Like I, I have a tendency to look at my friends and go, this is the best twist I've ever, you know, and it's, a, it's an eight minute normal twist, you know? Like, so I don't have a, usually a real good context in show right of what's happening you know until i re-listen and go back you know and 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 listen to it but i vividly remember everyone kind of going the ghost man the ghost was and i think for a lot of folks what i didn't really put together was how a little bit disappointing 521 was for folks and the ghost like i think for a lot of folks to get in they were it was tough ticket. We talked about yes, how tough a ticket it was. And so it was like, this is going to be an event and 521 just didn't get there, you know, musically. And then the go the ghost kind of made everybody remember, Oh, this isn't just a band playing in front of some record execs, you know, selling a record. This is fish still, you know, and they're not afraid to play a jam like ghost in a setting like radio city, which again, back to that dissonance, this, you know, a place where you would think you would play it safe, you know, and I think in some ways they did early on and in many versions, they do kind of play it safe, but man, the ghost, they just said, let's let it rip. Let's be us. All right. So Matt Campbell, AKA Famer time 2.0, if I got that right, let's, uh, let's uh, wrap it up and just remind everyone about the winter O3 project, the summer O3 project and cornerstones, what they are, where we could find you. All right. So Twitter, um, WMC hammer 33, um, and at famer time, uh, 2.0 or two is like, like Brian said, um, YouTube is under famer time as well. Um, where you'll find cornerstones and the winter and summer projects. They're, they're just on Twitter. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining me today on Attendance Bias to talk about the May 22nd, 2000 ghost, aka the Radio City ghost. There's a lot to digest here. And if you're a listener who, even if you've been into fish for 10 years and you haven't heard the Radio City ghost, your homework tonight, right now, is to right. check it out and just be overjoyed by it. Oh my gosh. And thank you for having me, Brian. Such a blessing. Your podcast is incredible. I appreciate you. We all do. Thank, thank you for having me, friend. That's it for today's sort of mini episode of Attendance Bias with Matt Campbell. To sum everything up, you can find Matt's Winter 03 and Summer 03 projects by following him on Twitter at WMCHammer33. That is WMCHAMMER33 on Twitter. And you can view his episodes of Cornerstones on YouTube by finding Famer Time. That's with a PH. Links to both are in today's show notes. Again, I'd like to thank Matt Campbell for joining me today, fish.net for providing all the information that we need, and fish.in, fishing, for a great recording of this track. If you enjoy Attendance Bias, please support the show by leaving a rating and a review of the show on your favorite podcast app. Spread the word. Thank you again for listening, and I'll see you next week on Attendance Bias. Attendance Bias.